it seems we've garnered quite a bit of new attention. So to my old followers, stay vigilant for the fated day. And for my new followers, rub yourself in salt, because it's time for Manga Macabre. You know, I always assumed that Konami was done for, especially after all those lawsuits regarding abusing employees, violating the Geneva Convention, and selling quote-unquote ape meat, and various other semi-legal life-and-death pachinko machines. But you know what they say about assuming. It makes the fabric of reality rip and reveal horrible truths or something something gets the worm. Speaking of worms, Castlevania is technically not an anime, but here's an anime blush, and that's anime enough for me. This is an adaptation of Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse. However, this one is a little bit darker and grittier. For those of you who don't care about video games, I'm going to advise to stay with me. I understand you have other things to do, as we all, like reading a book, or watching a movie, or arson. I'm going to insist on you sticking around because this is a bloody 90s style anime cheesy OVA, but with a modern sense of style to it. The story is relatively simple. Dracula comes back to life every hundred years or so to wreak havoc on the land. And whenever Dracula rises, one of the Belmont clan members is always here to stop him. Not exactly a Zelda situation where it's destiny, but more of a responsibility to the bloodline. This series is set a little closer to the Dark Ages, where Christianity and the church are having a huge rise in power. And the Belmonts use various types of holy magic and witchcraft to defeat Dracula and his vile forces. However, talking about defeating demons with magic is a great way to get yourself excommunicated. And that is exactly what happened to the Belmonts. Now, fortunately for the rest of humanity, this was during Dracula's quiet time, where he had found himself a nice girlfriend, and she is telling him to reveal his future technologies like soap, electricity, soap, and washing your hands with the peasants. This type of technology was very invaluable when you're a peasant, because at the time, it was likely you died at the age of 23, by drinking fecal contaminated water, or perhaps poking a festering wound with a stick, which admittedly was much like the cancer of today. After many years, Dracula decides it'd be wise to live like a person, like his human wife, and his wife decides that it's about time to bring back all of these medical and technological advances back to the people. However, the bishop disagrees and feels that it's God's plan for people to live more pious lives, free of complications like technology, electricity, and washing your hands. This naturally provokes Dracula's ire. For him, his wife was the one that convinced him that maybe humanity was worth it. But here, humanity is killing his wife and also extending their own lives by proxy and saying we don't want any of that. Dracula, being surprisingly more reasonable than a demon god should be in this kind of situation, given the circumstances that is, says what has two thumbs and will be genociding you all next year if you don't get out of the country. The answer to which is Dracula. So Dracula spends the next year summoning his fiendish legions from the depths of hell and summoning his castle, which I don't believe is ever called Castlevania in any game. Dracula's half-human son Alucard tries to convince his father that killing all of humanity would definitely not be what his late mother would have wanted. However, Dracula's rebuttal is something to the effect of, that sounds like a humanity problem now, and giving his son a very serious wound. One year later, Dracula returns to the capital to see if the people have taken his heed to heart. And what he found was an empty capital. Everyone had just left and left an apology note, and Dracula went home to have blood oranges. Which, of course, is a lie. He actually comes back to the Catholic Church holding a parade to honor the day Dracula was defeated and did not fulfill his promise as he's a servant of Satan. To which Dracula retorts with fireballs from the sky. 
and begins to seek his legions, the Night Horde, on an unsuspecting countryside. Speaking of Dracula's legions, usually in games his hordes consist of all sorts of various mythological and pop culture figures like Frankenstein's monster, werewolves, Dio Brando that one time, Death himself, and imps and goblins and the mummy and all sorts of things. However, here are mostly just generic demons. Later on we do see one that's a little bit more interesting, but I'll save that for later. Just something to make a note of that I miffed about because it shouldn't be a secret that I love all sorts of spooky monsters and preferably the less generic type, but I digress. While I'm off subject, this is a relatively fateful adaptation of Castlevania 3, albeit very much spiced up in that it's an NES game, thereby not having a whole lot of story to tell. On one end, we are adding in many more religious elements that were only implied during the game's events and backstories, but more so I mean in the sense of a lot of the characters, designs, and iconography are partially modeled after Game of Thrones. However, in the character dialogue, they seem to be more based around Marvel movie style fight dialogue. The biggest example here is Trevor Belmont, who is the protagonist of the series, who seems to be mostly a cross of the watch from Game of Thrones and Tony Stark. Well, an attitude, that is. Also, this seems to draw very heavy inspiration from 90s cheesy, violent OVAs, the type that you would find on the sci-fi channel during the 90s, or I suppose from anime in general during the 90s, and I suppose late 80s as well, with the likes of Baki the Grappler and Hokuto no Ken and Berserk, to a lesser degree that is. Our protagonist here is Trevor Belmont the last remaining of the Belmont clan who acts suspiciously like the Marvel Cinematic Universe's Tony Stark. He's a disillusioned, washed-up has-been who's just been roughed up by a group of drunken peasants hateful of noble families and political families as it's mostly their doing that's gotten the wrath of Dracula invoked on to the townspeople. However, I should mention, and this is one that we should return to once more of the series is out, there's a sub-theme of the series where the peasants not standing up for themselves is partially just as bad as the church's invoking of prejudice, in that by begetting these misdeeds, you are also by proxy okaying it, and okaying the oppression of other religious groups and ethnic minorities. That said, after a sound beating, Trevor makes his way to a nearby town in search of food and a place to lay his head. Unfortunately, that place has been ravaged by Dracula's forces. However, Trevor is more than equipped to handle demons and the like, and is also no stranger to seeing casualties, so this has relatively little effect on him. I should also mention there is a absolutely charming scene of a dead baby being dragged off by a demon. Well, uh, one man's trash, I suppose. While surveying the wrecked town and also scouting out food, Trevor bumps into two priests bullying an old man. And Trevor, being the reluctant hero that he is, just can't stand this and steps in and shows the two goons who's boss, in the process taking off one of their fingers with his whip. This always brought up a little bit of an issue that I've always had with Castlevania in that while I understand video game logic, how does one hurt something with a whip? If it was up to me, I would have used something more like a morning star or a flail. Whips only seem to be a, most dangerous for larger targets like cattle or bear, or I suppose for something more stationary. But in that case, you know how I do. I just, you know, if they're going to not move, hang them instead, or maybe a nice beheading but I suppose to each is their own when it comes to causing harm. The old man that Trevor saves turns out to be the leader of a group called the Speakers, a group of nomads, shamans, and scholars who invite Trevor back to their hut. But turns out they've been getting pressured on by the church for practicing various black magics. As it turns out, the church is scheduling to have all the Speakers murdered in a mob raid or run them out of town, either is fine. I don't know why the church is being so rude, it's like they say, you can drown more people in honey than you can in vinegar. 
it makes it harder for them to get away, or something like that. That doesn't quite sound right, but who am I to question ancient execution methodologies? However, the speakers aren't interested in leaving the city for two reasons. One, they can't turn away from people in need, and boy are these town people in need of being saved from demons who attack the town during the night. And also, the elder's granddaughter, who was last seen in the catacombs, hasn't come back. After hearing the plight of the people and having a shared disdain of the church leads to an agreement. Trevor offers to bring back the grandchild in exchange for the speakers packing up their things and leaving as they seem to be the only people willing to speak up against the church's actions, but that also simultaneously in Trevor's eyes make them worthy of a decent living and not being eaten by monsters. In the catacombs, Trevor finds a construction yard, actual lamps, and also a cyclops. Note here, again, I was initially afraid that the series would try to be a little bit too serious and hide all of the silly, wacky monsters that are more traditional in Dracula's legions and in Castlevania in general. However, I am very happy to know that they are comfortable enough to have a giant cyclops that shoots laser beams from its eyes that turn people into stone. Trevor defeats a cyclops and, in a slightly gory but interesting twist, the statues that had been littering the grounds and missing bits like hands and heads and some parts that are just entirely shattered turn back to their original human state, most of them being mangled corpses. However, among them is none other than Sypha, the woman that Trevor has been looking for. Sypha and Trevor return, but the Elder refuses to leave as they are still people in need and it's the speaker's job never to turn away from people in need. Later, Trevor is browbeat into a meeting with the bishop and is offered a pardon from the previous standings Belmont clan's excommunication and an exchange using his knowledge of demon fighting to protect the town people and the church in general, as their holy magic seems relatively ineffective against Dracula's forces. Trevor reluctantly agrees, and it's very clear that his fingers are partially crossed here, and he convinces the Elder to seek shelter in the catacombs temporarily to at least somewhat circumvent the incoming mob ready to kill them before Dracula's forces arrive on the town. Sypha and Trevor militarize the town people. Trevor gives instructions to the town people in basic combat and how to defeat demons, such as making holy water, using salt to fight them off, knowing that magic, like Sypha's, has natural tendencies that demons hate, and also use long pointy sticks so then the demons can't get you, which is, again, one that I would have thought would have came naturally, but, well, I suppose sticks with things at the end of them were invented eventually for a reason. The townspeople are able to fend off Dracula's forces for a time, with things getting a little too rough, Trevor being forced to break out his whip, the Vampire Killer which is very effective against various demons, and partially why the Belmonts are able to actually kill Dracula, because of this whip that is passed down through their bloodline. It seems like a thing that I would bring up earlier, but it really hasn't come up much until now. That said, these somewhat generic demons do make up in the way that they die at the hands of the Vampire Killer. They inflate and explode into light and a slurry of blood and guts. And as we all know, I am a fan of blood and guts. They make wonderful Christmas decorations. Not very good leftovers, though. Hmm. Meanwhile, the bishop, who has been set up as a more prominent antagonist, is eaten by a demon. Huh. You almost feel bad for him, except for not really. Trevor and Sypha fall into the catacombs and avoid a series of traps and japes and future spooky technology, concluding that this catacomb must belong to Dracula as he's the only one that has access to things such as light bulbs. Reaching the end of the catacombs, they find a mechanical coffin containing Alucard, Dracula's pre- So, my hopes going forward is a rounding out of the monster cast especially Dracula as this thing. So, what have we learned? Well, more than usual, 
One, God has no love for the cries of mortals. Depending on your religious beliefs, of course, this is a given, especially if your god of choice is, say, reptilian, mechanical, or alien in nature. Two, Game of Thrones is cool. And three, 90s blood and guts OVA are still in vogue, and I think that's news we can all drink to. So, if you like this video, don't forget, spiders know more than they are letting on. Don't trust them no matter what promises they make. So until next time, don't bother screaming, no one can hear you down here, and no 